So, um, yeah, I'm working in a research role here at the LSC, so I don't get to do much teaching. I'm not sure if this counts as teaching. I think it hopefully you just came along because you're interested in the topic. Um, maybe you can tell me, before we get started, uh, why are you members of the Emerging Markets Society? What interests you about emerging markets? Anyone? As, yes, please. Uh, well, I believe... <coughs> uh, well... I generally love markets, and uh, emerging markets present even more opportunities because, well, growth opportunities, because they're well, developing, obviously. Uh, so I'd like to know more about them, uh, and uh, hear how, uh, well, since there are a lot of representatives of uh, developing markets in our society, uh, I want to learn, uh, like, the viewpoints uh, from people who directly observe these markets and lived uh, and the consequences uh, that uh, those the actions in those markets uh, both create. Great, fantastic. Anyone else? Yep. I think um, in recent years, as developing markets have been growing, they've been encountering new issues that the countries who are developed right now never did before, because of the way that our technology is pro progressing, because of the number of crises that we're having. And I think that as they encounter more and more problems, there's more and more creativity required to solve the issues that they face. So I thought developing markets would be a good way for me to learn more about different kinds of things in that realm. Yeah, fantastic. So um, I think in, in both of those, uh, those answers, we've got the lo love markets, but you're going to love the Washington consensus. So it raises an interesting question around what's happening to global politics today and how we think about states and markets and their interaction with that statement. Um, and also very interesting that emerging markets are growing and that's something I think it would be really interesting to talk about later as well because I think you know one of the things I'm going to touch on in today's talk is actually there's huge inequalities in, what, in the concept of developing markets or emerging markets right as well so some have certainly seen runaway growth but for many others some of which I'll touch on today the Washington consensus didn't deliver the runaway growth that they hoped for, that states hoped for in that particular um, period. Um, so, yeah, so in today's uh, lecture, I'll touch on what is the Washington consensus. Um, I don't know who wrote it, but congratulations on whoever put the blog up in anticipation um, of today's talk. Um, that gives a really good uh, account of the Washington Consensus with about eight or nine uh, good readings. So that's on the LSE, LSESU Developing uh, Markets blog. So I would happily recommend it. I will offer my own definition and description um, at the beginning. Um, I'll, I'll ask uh, how would we judge its persistence um, to this day or not? And I think that's actually a really difficult question uh, to answer. And I don't think I'll even be able to offer perhaps much of an answer today. Maybe that's something we can talk about. The extent to which what we mean by the Washington Consensus continues to persist in 2022. There's also a question, by the way, that I'll come on to, which um, is whether there was ever even a Washington Consensus. Is the whole idea of a Washington Consensus really something of a myth that was constructed afterwards, both by proponents of the policies we associate with it and by critics as well, so on both um, sides. And yeah, I will you know, broadly put forward the case that there isn't any um, consensus. So as the blog on the, um, uh, the Society website outlines very nicely, uh, the term Washington Consensus is actually associated with an economist called John Williamson who introduced it as an idea um, in 1990. And he had a, a very interesting career. I think he might have passed away one or two years ago. But he became to really regret um, catch, catching, capturing um, this term and terminology because of the way it was used afterwards, both by proponents um, and critics. Um, but he outlined a 10-point programme. And what he meant by the consensus is the unity of these, uh, these, this block, these forces, if you like. The World Bank and IMF both have their headquarters in Washington. Uh, global, as we know, international economic institutions that are responsible for regulating the global uh, economy, 
formed after the Second World War to bring about macroeconomic stability. The IMF responsible for emergency lending, so for states that are experiencing uh, balance of payments crises. The World Bank responsible for long-term development uh, lending and economic um, assistance. So those international institutions on the one side, based in Washington, and if you like political Washington, the US presidency, uh, Congress, etc. And what Williamson was talking about was the convergence of these um, forces, these Washington-based forces around a particular set of economic um, prescriptions and, and, and going out into the world to promote those ideas uh, in some cases, in, especially in the US case, pretty aggressively, I say. And yeah, it had a series of different um, uh, uh, proposals or basic principles for effective economic and development policy, balanced budgets, so you shouldn't, you sh you shouldn't let your uh, state financing run out of control, you should have a stable monetary policy, you should where in order to create economic competitiveness and open up um, opportunities for global and local um, investors, <coughs> uh, privatise public goods to generate more uh, competition in the market. You should review your regulations to see whether it's in creating a regulatory burden on economic activity that's making the economy uncompetitive. And that's all part of a mix that basically is opening the developing uh, market to the rest of the world. So through trade and financial uh, liberalisation, you make it much um, easier for the state in question to trade externally and to, uh, and, and to attract international investment. So you make it easier for money to move across borders very simply. And that, more or less, in the rough, is the Washington consensus as it was put forward um, in the early uh, 1990s. Here, though, we need another um, element of of background, and that's the political debate and argument that's going on, particularly across the West um, in the 1970s and 1980s. And a really important summit that established a new political consensus amongst the rich world was the 1984 uh, London Economic Summit <coughs> that brought together the G7 of the richest industrialised nations. And at that summit that was hosted by Margaret Thatcher, obviously, because it's in London, and she was Prime Minister of the UK um, at the time. Uh, at that summit, that, that was an important event for Thatcher uh, in Britain and Reagan in the United States in bringing the rest of the West, or the most powerful states in the West, behind their new economic strategy. And broadly, that was breaking up and changing uh, the post-war equilibrium that had existed from around, the, around 1950 to the middle of the 1970s and it's associated in the, the United States with the New Deal consensus and in Western Europe with social democracy, the idea that the state should intervene in the economy to manage economic development and that might involve nationalisation of uh, strategic industries um, it might involve creating a social welfare uh, safety net um, and, it, and, and, it, and it will involve some kind of part, bipartisan, uh, bipartisan approach to managing economic activity that includes trade unions and labour on one side and business and the private sector on the other side. And together, the state, business and labour would cooperate to try to manage economic development. Thatcher and Reagan drew the conclusion that having the state, uh, sorry, excuse me, having Labour in such an influential position in the politics of how e economics was managed, uh, that was made rendering Western economies extremely uncompetitive. It was undermined it, and it lay behind the crises as they saw it of the 1970s and they proposed doing something different. In the 1984 summit, was important because they persuaded other European elites to basically follow um, their lead. In Reagan's farewell address, he even identified the 1984 uh, London summit as the point where everyone was started asking him about the American economic miracle that 
um, that, 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 that they perceived the US as carrying through uh, at the time. And yeah, well, I won't go into that, but we could talk about it um, later, actually. Um, so yeah, I've mentioned some of this stuff um, already, but the origin points of the Washington Consensus lie in the economic crisis of the 1970s. That's particularly associated with the rapid rise in oil prices that produces an inflationary shock, the last inflationary, major inflationary shock. Um, we're living through another one today, of course, through rising energy prices. So it produces this big inflationary shock in the cost of goods. And this had a huge effect on the third world in particular, just like today. It again is having a huge effect on the third world because those rising commodity prices are particularly damaging for if you are poor and you can't afford to import the oil, oil and gas at the price the market is setting or food that's now uh, rocketing as well. And so this, and in order to get around this problem, states in the global south and the third world borrowed a lot of money and they borrowed it from uh, Western banks. And when this didn't capitalise their economic development, they found that they had non-performing loans, that they couldn't pay the Western banks back. And that's how you get, more or less, by the middle of the 1980s, the third world debt um, crisis. And so th th those are sort of global elements of the picture. Um, Reagan, in his uh, farewell address to the nation, um, I think it makes quite an interesting comment because he argues that, well, we, we set about to change America. We set about to introduce a new um, domestic economic policy that would make the state smaller, that would hand back power to ordinary Americans, that would reduce the social uh, welfare safety net, and that would stimulate and lower taxes, and in doing so, that would all stimulate economic <coughs> growth. And he said, well, we meant to change a nation, but instead we changed a world. And at the 1984 uh, London summit, what was already very well known and what Reagan was well aware of was the third world debt crisis. I think the element of surprise, and this allows the Washington consensus to completely globalise, is the fall of communism. Uh, in the second half of the 1980s, particularly the events of 1989. And it's at that moment that this consensus can start at least to appear as a new global um, consensus. Yes, it's, as we're going to come on to, it was contested, but it opened up well, the, uh, the part of the world economy that was cut off from international financial markets and capital markets, i.e. the communist um, world. It allowed it to really globalise. And lastly, as I touched upon previously, there's this change in social democracy, change in the global centre-left that happens. Margaret Thatcher said something along the lines of, my real victory was Tony Blair in one of her speeches. And what she meant by that is when social democracy accepted, the centre-left accepted her ideas, it was at that point that uh, you could start to talk about that them being a political success story. It was at that point that she could really have, really have achieved an, a sort of triumph in shifting the political centre of gravity in Britain and um, globally. Um, the year before the London summit of 1984, in France there was a big uh, crisis affecting Francois Mitterrand's government. Uh, he had tried to pursue a really radical left-wing economic program. It had a lot of problems with, uh, the, with, Euro with European financial markets at the time, and he basically admitted defeat. He said it wasn't possible. So by 1984, social democracy is kind of really in retreat in Europe, and we can start to talk about this emerging um, alternative. And one of the most controversial elements in the picture that is associated with the Washington Consensus is the impact of international monetary fund structure adjustment programs on states that fall into economic difficulty from the middle of the 1980s. Uh, through to today, structural adjustment programs have been rebranded. I think they're now called enhanced structural adjustment programs, but they still um, exist. 
And academics would have feverish debates in the 1980s and 1990s over whether structural adjustment programs were successful for the states that were in financial difficulty uh, at the time, feeling the effects of the third world um, debt crisis or not. One case study you might want to look at that uh, was really subject to qu quite a lot of argument was Uganda. And basically that argument comes down to whether you l just look at its um, macro broad macroeconomic progress indicators, so particularly GDP growth, uh, per capita GDP growth, or whether you look at other human development indicators, things like life expectancy um, and so on. And so by the middle of the 1990s, some people were saying Uganda has been a success story under structural adjustment. Other people were saying, well, actually, human development in Uganda has gone down. But even as you can see from some of this data, the, uh, the impact of structural adjustment programs on broad macroeconomic uh, basis is still pretty weak for most of the countries that were subject to this agenda and had them kind of imposed, uh, pretty much imposed um, on them. Of course, as we know from the successful states, um, the successful emerging markets, the rapid developers, to achieve that leap from being very poor to being middle income, you need really, really high growth rates because, and I'm sure you know this better than me because many of you will be studying subjects with maths, a small percentage of a small number is, uh, is, 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 not a, is not a significant figure. If you want to go up rapidly, you need to be getting growth rates of 8, 10, 12, 13, 14 percent if you want to climb the ladder. There's no good having year-on-year -year annual growth of 1, 2, 3 percent. You're going to remain um, very um, poor. And so now, I think, uh, I guess we'll come on to talk about this um, a bit later that you know the IMF is not the organization it was in the middle of the 1990s there's generally speaking much more debate around um, the role of the state in economic uh, management but there's still if you look at some of these clauses like Ghana's there's still a, uh, a basic the, the terminology of fiscal <coughs> consolidation is often used and that tends to refer by the IMF and others to austerity like politics or what they would call a sound economic management. So in that respect, these kinds of policies are, are very much still with us. Now, as I mentioned um, earlier, there's a, there's a problem, uh, an obvious problem perhaps when we talk about the Washington consensus is that in some ways there was never really a consensus. If we mean by the Washington consensus the ideas of Thatcher and Reagan, well, outside of the West, there was always a lot of contestation of those ideas. Indeed, there was inside the West, but the people that contested them just tended to be uh, politically defeated. And this, I think some, for sake of time, I'll just mention a few of these. So the shock therapy that was applied in the, the post-communist space in the 1990s was hugely destructive. Russia basically had this idea that Russia needed to dismantle its communist planning instruments as rapidly and as quickly as possible, even if that proved to be very destructive on a human development level, and even if it meant um, uh, rapidly creating a new oligarchic class in very short order. The legacy of this, these policies, by the way, live on arguably in the Russian war against Ukraine. And what's interesting about them is that many people did, or, or looking back at it now, many people did challenge the consensus. I've picked out um, Strobe Talbot here, that on a visit to Russia in 1993, said Russia needs uh, less shock and more therapy, so a more <coughs> gradualist approach to economic development. But he was the uh, Deputy Secretary of State, so Deputy uh, Foreign Minister, essentially, to use European language. Um, but, his, the tre but the American Treasury was pursuing at the same time in uh, combination with the, the International Monetary Fund and World Bank a completely different policy. But he did speak out against the consensus. 
he said it was going too far and too fast. Another example of within the elites of a challenger to the extent that consensus is Joseph Stiglitz. Uh, he was the chief economist of the World Bank and has thought very consistently throughout the whole of his career that states and markets were most effective when they are state-managed and state-regulated. And he argued that in the 1980s and 1990s, i.e. didn't go along with the consensus. But perhaps the most interesting challenge to it is the rapid developers. Because the rapid developers just turn around and say, well, we're not going to follow these prescriptions. And they achieve a great deal of economic success. <laughs> they pursue a state aid, something that the Washington Consensus more or less says you shouldn't do because it's uncompetitive. And they pick winners amongst their private sector companies. They deliberately um, advantage some companies over others in order to develop their industrial capacity. They pursue export-led industrialization, and in the process, rather than opening their markets to global finance and international trade competition, they protect their domestic uh, markets. And they drive, they, they mobilize the state to drive very high levels of investment into the domestic economy. And the payoff for this is relatively low levels of economic inequality compared to states that pursued the Washington Consensus type prescription. And, uh, and, and an aversion of that is, is, is pursued by China as well. So the idea of the end of the Washington Consensus is pretty much as old as the Washington Consensus. It's always been contested. Um, this is a, a statement by Danny Roderick, who's an academic, who's um, very critical of uh, trade and financial globalisation. And he argued in, in 2006 that we should be saying RIP to the Washington <coughs> Consensus. Everyone agrees now that it doesn't work. Interestingly, this comes before the global financial crisis of 2008, 2009. It becomes before the Eurozone crisis of um, the last, or well, post-2010, the last uh, the, the first part of the last decade. And so people were already calling time on the Washington Consensus even before we got to the present day. So at this stage, before talking about some more case studies and history, I'll just uh, put forward a hypothesis as why I think that, that, it, that, that things might be changing. And more or less, I would argue that after the 2008 global financial crisis, and as a, result of, uh, as a result of persistent crises, some of which are endogenous um, to markets and some of which are exogenous um, to them, but, but they are, have a persistent character, it means that states, uh, sorry, markets are becoming much, much more dependent on states. And this undermines some of the core claims of the original Washington Consensus, which is that markets left to their own devices would deliver high levels of economic growth. And so, on the other hand, we also see that many of the neoliberal structures that are associated with this period, so financial globalization, integrated global capital markets, relatively integrated global trading system, they still endure, but they're sort of paradoxically more and more dependent on state intervention. And a good example of that, or the, or the perfect example of that, would have been the bailouts of Western banks after the, in the process of the 2008 financial crisis, <coughs> that they were unviable and that they became dependent on massive state intervention. And in that context, it's not really surprising that we see alternative ideological paradigms emerge because it's hard to be, an, it's hard to be a free marketeer when free markets are more and more dependent on state intervention in order to function. So that's more or less the hypothesis. I think within that hypothesis, you could talk about COVID-19 pandemics. That's a huge exogenous shock to the system. What happened? Markets can't function in the situation of lockdown. The state intervened massively in countries all over the world to protect and underpin um, markets. But an even bigger shock that's a slow burn one, not a rapid pandemic, is of course climate change. 
So the, pro the, the difficulties of insurance, in a, for example, or any other form of risk taking by pri the private sector in a situation where ecological crisis is becoming more and more persistent. So we can anticipate that markets will only go on becoming more dependent on state intervention. OK. Good party going on next door. Uh, so, sorry that you're stuck listening to my lecture on the Washington Consensus. But um, so the, the one factor I think we can throw in at this stage, or case study, is that w Washington doesn't believe in the Washington Consensus uh, anymore. By Joe Biden recently says, I, I don't believe in trickle-down econ economics. He was um, attacking very explicitly and quite undiplomatically the policy of the, what was then the British government. You will have noticed that the British government is, that, that is now deceased, uh, the Trust administration. Uh, this one, I think, is more interesting in some ways. Our politicians have aggressively pursued a policy of globalisation, moving our jobs, our wealth and our factories to Mexico and overseas. Globalisation has made the financial elite who donate to politicians very wealthy, but it has left millions of our workers with nothing but poverty and heartache. Any, quest any guesses on who that quote is from? Huh. Yeah. Jordan? Who said, sorry? Bernie Sanders? I was, hoping, yeah, I was hoping someone would say Bernie Sanders, but it is in fact Donald Trump. Um, and particularly if you, but it, would, but it could have been said by Bernie Sanders. But if you follow some of the narratives of his 2016, I talk about it in my book if you're interested. Um, plug, plug the book, sorry. Uh, but uh, the 2016 election, until I went away and properly researched it and studied it, the things that I remembered as, a, as an observer reading the news were Trump calling immigrant, Mexican immigrants rapists. I remembered and recalled his proposal to ban Muslim immigration from the United States, i.e. I remembered all the shock and awe racism of his campaign. What's interesting, and probably goes some way to explaining his victory, is when I went away and studied it and looked at it, it was striking at how, yes, there was that shocking racist element, but there were also lots of statements like this one. And he was full of warm words to, for Bernie Sanders after he uh, fell out of the Democratic uh, nomination um, race. He very explicitly, I think in his Republican National Convention talk after Trump took the um, nomination, said, hey, Bernie voters, come over to us. We're going to uh, protect you. I will protect you. I'm essentially the left-wing candidate now um, in this race. And it goes some way to explaining, I think, his victory uh, in the Rust Belt um, states. Of course, it was, all, it was all rubbish. I mean, he wasn't actually proposing anything that would help American um, workers, but the narrative was very, very... Uh, left wing and even radical. Here's another case study, and I'm, I'm going to finish in a minute because I'm going to try, I'm going to pretty much finish on time, hopefully. But China, and we can talk about this more, has constructed a very clear alternative to the Washington consensus. Um, even when it comes to financial and capital market um, liberalization uh, internationally, too, China has a state run and state controlled banking system so it, it's really quite an unusual that, and that's quite an unusual thing in this period of financial and trade uh, globalization to say that your your entire banking system more or less will be either state run or state supported and so what it's pursued is a kind of bureaucratic very authoritarian state managed capitalism that involves this implicit social contract if you call it that or with the new elites, the new rich that has emerged um, in China, the new billionaire class. And that is, you can have your wealth and power, you can invest in technology and so on, as long as you recognise the absolute supremacy of not only the Chinese Communist Party, but now in 2022 we can say Xi Jinping himself. It's become a very personalised political um, dictatorship over the last uh, 12 years. And in that period... 
there's been a real clamping down and control on any private sector activity that's considered a threat or challenge to the, the rule of the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, and tech is the probably, uh, the new tech industry is probably the clearest example of that. This is an interesting one. I've been working on a project in Ukraine. Um, we can talk about it more in, in the discussion. Um, so this is the sort of strange non-death of the Washington consensus. So even though Ukraine is fighting a war against a foreign power, um, even though in most total war scenarios, a conventional war scenario, we would expect, and this is what the United States did in the Second World War, it's what Britain did in the Second World War, we would expect the states to basically take over the entire economy in order to direct uh, labour and capital towards the war effort. The Ukrainians at the moment aren't doing that, and it does me make their war of resistance to the Russian invasion very, very vulnerable, because they have uh, around one in three people are unemployed, higher amongst the internally um, displaced. Uh, you have a very significant rise um, in poverty, too. And you have this labour reform that the government has pushed through, labour market deregulation, um, that is supposedly meant to encourage uh, capitalist investment. But, I mean, it doesn't really make sense on its own terms, because there will always be reasons why, in a war, capitalists will not be investing. Capitalist business confidence will be low. What happens if, you're, if you build a new factory and that factory is then bombed by Russians. And in any case, labour costs have collapsed in Ukraine. So many people who have not lost their jobs have taken big reductions in their wages. So it's hard to see how they could go any lower or how this would stimulate economic activity. So this sort of market-based prescription for an economy and a country at war hasn't been tried before. And it does reflect, I'd say, the influence or the enduring influence of the Washington Consensus. Final point then, I've only run a little bit over. I, according, to, according to me, and this is obviously just what I think, you might think something different, but I think that because you see all of these crises uh, generate, being generated uh, for, as I mentioned earlier, it might be climate crises, it might be runaway economic inequality, uh, it might be pandemics. Because you see these persistence of crises and because you see, at least in Western societies, a kind of crisis of the middle class, if you like, wage levels stagnant, inflation rising, people feel like they're getting poorer even in the middle of society, even previously affluent parts of society. And economic growth tends to be pretty low in the West. So for all of those reasons, it becomes hard to sustain the kind of ideological arguments that Thatcher and Reagan made in the 1980s. So they argued that markets would do the job, the state should get out of society and they even made a virtue of pretty much saying I won't protect you if you want the nanny state to protect you if you want social security vote for the other party vote for the other guys we're not going to do that and so for that to work you had to have a growing middle class that were really attracted to the idea of self-reliance really belie believed that their economic activity and their hard work and their graft um, got their you know, nice house with their suburban lawn or whatever, that's what, that's what achieved it. You had to sort of have that as a structural foundation. When that no longer exists, you get an alternative phenomenon. You get a demand for protection. And in some ways, that's what Donald Trump perhaps represents. The demand for protection doesn't have to mean doesn't have to go in a positive way and so it could mean that actually strong man and they usually are man, men leaders saying yeah we will protect you and you know what your interests your identity say as white median income uh, men your identity is really at risk from all these other people 
uh, really at risk from all these immigrants, whether they, all these Muslims, and I will protect you. And what's more, um, you're so serious of the risks that you, you face, that justifies attacks on democracy, because democracy is not working in your interests. Uh, and, and if you persuade a group of people that democracy and the rule of law system isn't working for them, or that they face a series of other threats from people that are benefiting, supposedly, from the rule of law system or the human rights system, then they may well support political attacks on the democratic system. And I think that's kind of what you see in many countries across the world, even in non-democratic countries like China, there's a kind of version of authoritarian protectionism that Xi Jinping has put forward, kind of based on a Han Chinese uh, na ethnic nationalism. I will protect you. The Chi Chinese Communist Party state will protect you from all of these others, whether they are foreign or domestic enemies of the Chinese uh, nation. So that's it. That's the talk. Questions? Let's see if you have questions. Hi, um, I want to posit that the ideology of I won't protect you does not necessarily happen in emerging economies, particularly in sub Saharan Africa, but then we see the generation of this demand for protectionism, and I could give Ghana as an example, um, where like um, a lot of the political ideologies to build social um, wealth or to build um, wealth that is not necessarily for the, uh, the middle class, but for everyone. Um, but then we see that um, despite, uh, after the pandemic, Ghana has failed miserably at like keeping its CD at appreciable levels and is currently following through with an IMF structural adjustment plan um, for about 3 billion Ghana CDs. And I'm wondering, like everything you said, I really enjoyed your talk, but I'm wondering how does this translate to emerging economies, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa? How could they be, um, how do I say this, be like at the forefront of dealing with this conversation about the end of political <coughs> consensus when we see that it still persists in terms of like Ghana going forward this like structural adjustment to how could they be at the forefront of changing the narrative for themselves um, rather than waiting for um, the IMF and the World Bank to jump onto this journey? Yeah, it's a great point. And um, so uh, does, uh, I'm not sure what you would call it, but it's clearly, clearly something that's not the Washington consensus but involves very similar policy prescriptions still exists. It's just not a consensus in the way that it was understood. It's part of this much more fractured um, global order. And I won't say I can't comment on Ghana but my colleagues, because I, yeah, I, I can't answer that case specifically, but my colleagues in the research unit that I'm attached to at LSE Ideas work on Sudan, South Sudan, uh, Somalia, uh, they have worked on DRC, and basically these are countries that um, have experienced intractable violence and conflict, <coughs> which becomes very difficult to stop. And I would say that something akin to authoritarian protectionism is operating in those situations of violent conflict, and it does link to the persistence of whether you call it the Washington Consensus, but societies that have experienced very rapid economic an uncontrollable, if you like, economic liberalisation that has led to significant social insecurity and has then created a kind of beggar thy neighbour, a series of beggar thy neighbour conflicts that become, that turn to violence and then the violence becomes very difficult to stop um, because uh, armed groups are basically using violence to extract resources from vulnerable populations and it links to criminal, criminal activity and crony capitalism. And so what, where that features with the Washington consensus is basically these are, these are states that don't have, that have been sort of encouraged to reduce their state capacity over several decades. Right. So when you reduce your state capacity, then you reduce your law and order system and then you end up with what we've called like kind of fragmented state environments. It doesn't 
I, I don't think that that's the whole picture, but I think that there is certainly this one of the effects of financial globalization has been that it makes it very easy for uh, whether it's corrupt politicians or whether it's criminals or whether it's Al Qaeda or that's a bit old fashioned or, or you know, um, yeah, or, or, or Al Shabaab or whoever to capture economic resources from a domestic society and then hide it very quickly and very easily in global financial markets and launder it through those markets essentially. And that's a general problem in the structure of financial globalization that we have legal institutions that have basically continued to enable um, that kind of activity. Going from what you said, do you think so? Oh. Washington consensus and just generally the neoliberal nature of economics at that time contributed to neo-imperialist structures continuing to exist in Africa? Great question. So while I think about it, there were some other hands, so I'll take a few. Should we go here and then here and then, then over here? Oh, yeah, I was going to ask. So I understand the policies pursued by the East Asian economies with rapid growth actually historically were pursued by Western countries like the US and America in their early stages of industrialization. So what do you think about the question that perhaps the Washington consensus and like the policy prescriptions around that um, being imposed by like the World Bank and the IMF, etc., actually had the motivation of their own economic growth rather than the growth of these countries because they allowed them to have more space for their products in these markets by opening up, by liberalising. So would you say that that's a fair assessment, that it was always for their benefit rather than to grow these emerging economies? Yeah, so I agree with, I agree with the argument underpinning your position and what I would add to it is that, that no, one, no one has really in some ways ever been consistently a free trader, right? So Britain, when it rose, was a very aggressive colonial power um, that aggressively protected markets, that used the power of the Royal uh, Navy, that didn't, wasn't, wasn't interested in giving other states, um, states uh, uh, equal access to the markets that it, it controlled. And whether, whether that was true within the IMF is a really interesting and almost ethnographic subjective question, isn't it? So what did the actual practitioners on promoters of these policies, were they motivated by a kind of hidden, uh, a hidden interest to stay at the top of the apex of economic development? I'm not sure about that conclusion, conclusion because I would generally see, I would generally think that most, most political actors usually believe their own ideas, even if we consider those ideas propagandistic in some ways. So I think it links to the links to the imperialism question. So yes, I think that there are definitely in how global economic structures have been organized and run strong elements of imperialism. One of the best definitions or one of the ones definitions that I find most interesting when it comes to talking about imperialism is by a writer called Partha Chatterjee. And he um, argues that imperialism in the modern world and what he means by that is or what I mean by that is like the last 40 years say or you know the, the contemporary world the last 50 years or so the period after the collapse of formal empires the way that imperialism operates is through this power to declare the exception on the rules that you insist that other people um, follow so it's sort of what the IMF is doing is creating if you like general rules um, but then if you're powerful enough of course you can be exempt and accepted it, it be an exception from those rules and you know at the high point of the Washington consensus or maybe a bit after the high point you know the United States introduced steel tariffs to protect its domestic markets so you know it wasn't wasn't pursuing the norms and rules that were promoted in international trade and financial organizations yeah, we're going to go over here next, and then there's quite a few others. Yeah, I actually have two questions. Uh, one of them, like, on the slide, you showed some countries which kind of uh, were able to uh, pursue aggressive economic development. Yeah, and those countries were uh, Singapore, 
South Korea <coughs> and, 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 and others. So I was trying to kind of explain the middle income trap. So why those countries were able to uh, overcome the middle income trap. And what I found uh, interesting is that the countries that overcame the middle income trap and were able to do, to develop economically, they had uh, close no military ties with the United States. So none of the countries, like all the countries that were able to penetrate the middle income trap, to go above it, they had strong military ties with the, with the United States. And my hypothesis is that uh, to become economically advanced, the country needs technologies. And technologies, like the, mean, the means of production, and the means of production comes from advanced economies. So that's one. And the second hypothesis is this, is that the advanced products that those countries produce, they need, uh, they need uh, buyers, they, like they need markets. And the domestic market is not, is not enough because you know, South Korea cannot sell all its cars just in South Korea. It's in, it's in access to more, um, well-paying citizens, and those citizens are also in developed countries. And I, and I think that, this, um, <coughs> that there is an inherent, uh, inherent dependency on advanced, on advanced economies. So the club of advanced countries will, will not allow any other emerging market to become kind of developed unless it has military ties with the... With, uh, yeah, great set of points. I broadly agree, like, um, and uh, well, agree with 90%. A very interesting example, I think, of what you're talking about now is the China US China, conflict. Yeah. So, you know, the, Amer the, the, the Biden administration and the Trump administration mm -hmm. basically support similar policies, interestingly enough, passing very, very aggressive rules on uh, semiconductors at the moment that are going through Congress, really trying to squeeze China's access to new technology. And although China has this, China is, you know, perhaps not, a, doesn't have the same level of dependency potentially, or this is the question, <coughs> because it has such a huge <coughs> internal uh, market. So how dependent, uh, can China use that market to sort of, to overcome it's the middle income trap. Some regions in China have overcome the middle income trap. China, Ch Shanghai, high, high income polity. Um, but of course, there's huge diversity within that context. So it's a, if you look at the stagnant economic growth in China now, basically stagnant, it's a really sort of interesting pivot point now as to whether this sort of very aggressive American competition mm -hmm. with China and how that's going to sort of play out and whether it will be successful in suppressing its economic development. There were loads of other questions. Uh, let's take going <laughs> starting here and then going back. Yep. Uh, yeah, yeah, sorry. Okay. You, you, um, yeah, one, two, three. Yeah. Um, so I've been studying this like in my past classes for two weeks, and there is something that no one has mentioned, but that always drives my attention, which is... Whenever we talk about the Washington consensus in Latin America specifically, um, we are talking about the debt crisis. However, interestingly, when these debt were contracted, the entire Latin America was taken by dictatorships, which have plenty of historical evidence to point that they were uh, orchestrated by the USA. So, it always strikes me that there is like this entire region of the world that contracted debt when following an imperialistic uh, demand which was forcefully enforced. And then when this regime ends and there is the need of the debt, the condition for the debt is that these countries adopt the economical policies. And every time I see an analysis of the Washington consensus overall, I miss the information about what was the interest, the interest behind it, like why, who was gaining from it, because it seems to me like the crisis was created by an agent and then 
this same agent said that, oh, I, I will save it. And then, of course, it didn't. So I, I always miss this. Do you know, like, do you have any recommendations of places I can read about it or where I can find this information? Who gained? Is, is that the... It's not who gained. It's more like there is historical evidence that the the dictatorships were orchestrated by the U.S. plenty. So it's kind of like, it's not even a debate anymore. And then we have the, also the evidence that the conditions for the loans were based on the Washington Consensus and that the Latin American countries needed the loans because they were in that. So where can I read about what the U.S. has gained or why, why were these conditions implemented when people back then had the historical information that about who created the crisis. That's kind of what I'm trying to get Let, to. Let's, uh, yes. I mean, I, I'm not sure if I have a, I, I can, if you email me, I can think of maybe, I can have a, consider like some of the recommendations. I mean, he's not really a Latin Americanist, but from what you're saying, you know, David Hogg's work might be interesting, his book New Imperialism, because it sort of tries to link these geopolitical things <coughs> with the yeah. economic prescriptions. But, <coughs> yeah, it's not much on Latin America in there, so, yeah. Um, yes, let's go. Yeah, I just wanted to revert back to the slide on the Asian tigers. So, it's evident that, say, Singapore and South Korea pursued very aggressively protectionist policies in their rise, but in literature I've read, for example, Milton Friedman uses Hong Kong as an example of a success story of amazing fair economics. I just wanted to know why there's such a big discrepancy between the policies they used and how they both managed to achieve similar results at the end. Yeah, that's a good one. I mean, I, there's this, you find it on um, YouTube as well, there's this really funny video that Milton Friedman made about Hong Kong in the 1980s, saying like what a wonderful uh, society it was. I don't, I think, yeah, it's a really good, it's a really good question. And of course, in arguing that um, we shouldn't talk monolithically about economic policy in emerging markets, this is equally true of the Asian tigers as well. I mean, one argument is that basically Hong Kong is benefiting from its relationality to China at the time. So, so because China is behind this um, basically economic wall, that it has that it ends up generating this sort of capitalistic emigre population that it becomes a kind of by the 1980s as China is starting to open up Hong Kongers are at the center of that economic advance and they're the first sort of port of call for investment in the new Chinese economy and Hong Kong you know at the end of the 1960s was a very poor country so if you think that's only, you only need to get 10 years later, your China starts to open up in 1979. Really, Hong Kong's advance in some ways is very intermingled with the Chinese advance, but it's one aspect. I think there are probably others too to think about. Yes? I was wondering more on like current geopolitics and like the entire idea that we're going to near shore and reshore a bunch of things. Uh, how might that like affect particularly Washington U.S. policy towards uh, primarily Latin America? Like, for example, the recent like Chips Act that allocates so I forget how many millions it was to manufacturing in Mexico and all that. How might that might that impact uh, Washington policy towards like meeting um, U.S. allies, which seem to be like the number one candidates to replace all these like more national security sensitive production that they want to like sort of bring. Yeah, well, the whole green transition, and I'm not sure how Latin America is situated within this picture, but the whole green transition is very much obsessed with the extraction of critical raw materials. So if we think about, if we think about sort of waves of extractivism, if you like, in the global south, we're currently going to be living through a new period of extractivism, and... The U.S. will be U.S. will be a big actor. Obviously, China is already an actor, and China has the advantage that it has a domestic source of critical raw materials, and has and it has to some degree been ahead of the game in creating new 
um, sources of critical raw materials, so things that we need to make semiconductors, things that we need to make uh, solar panels, etc. All of those items that will be hugely important to the green transition, they have to come uh, from somewhere. And the European Union is catching up as well. Um, in this very sort of European Union way, it's terribly transparent um, about it. So you can go to the European Commission website and find these great maps of global sources of critical raw materials and markets that the European Union sees as a priority for its investors and to creating basically supply chain security. And so I, obviously this does um, impact on some of the issues we've been talking about, these kind of quasi new, a new kind of quasi-imperialism. And so for China, the politics of this are really very interesting because it's uh, such a, a country that's sort of defined by its opposition to Western imperialism, defined by its opposition to what they call the century of humiliation where Western powers uh, pillaged the Chinese state, essentially. So ideologically, it sees itself as this kind of anti-imperialist actor, if you like. I mean, I think it's baloney, but for argument's sake, that's how it sees itself, right? Um, but, you know, you can, in, in terms of China's engagement with Africa, you can very much foresee or imagine what a kind of Chinese interventionism would look like. It would probably look like, you know, Chinese contractors um, who might be, say, kidnapped in a Central African state while operating, you know, for, uh, undertaking work for a Chinese company, and would China then be sort of 